This evening we're back in the book of Romans. If you'd like to turn that up, you're certainly welcome to do so. Romans chapter 6. I'd like to read for you the uh, same text because the text contained, as you know, two things. Uh, not only the, um, the fact that we have died with Christ to sin, but also that we have been raised with him uh, to newness of life. We not only died with him when he died on the cross, but when he was raised from the dead, we were also raised to this newness of life, which, of course, should reflect in the way that we actually do live. So let's read that again in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this evening. Now those of you who are here this morning, remember that we consider that if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you have submitted to him as your Lord, then when he died on the cross, you also died with him to sin. Certainly not to righteousness, but to sin. And that doesn't mean that you are now morally perfect, doesn't mean that you are sinlessly perfect, but what it does mean is the power of sin has been broken in your life. And that you no longer desire to do things I should say, at least, you'll no longer submit to those things that are dishonoring to God. Sadly, we still do have some desire uh, to do those things. Sometimes we have the desire to do things that hurt other people, that just please ourselves, and that bring glory and honor to ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to put ourselves aside. So the desire that God has given to us uh, not to sin is not perfect. We still struggle with sin. The old man, you might say, is still alive, even though it has been crucified. It's not entirely dead. So our heart is divided between what is good and what is evil. But thankfully, the Lord promises that our desire against evil will win to the point that we will not practice any sin because we are no longer the slaves of sin. Again, that's what we saw this morning, but certainly there is more in this text as there is much more in the Bible. Not only are we no longer the slaves to sin, but we are the slaves or the servants of righteousness now through the power of Christ. Not only has the power of sin been broken, but the Lord has given to us the power to obey. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, so the Lord says that you have been raised to a new kind of life. The word in the Greek 
basically refers to something that is radically new. It's something that you did not have before. As a matter of fact, that's what the Bible says. You were born into this world with a heart that is purely inclined towards sin. But when the Lord saves you, when he raises you to life, he gives to you a new principle that is, as you'll recall from, from previous sermons, is a principle of love for what is good and what is right. That is really the only change that God makes within your heart. It's the only change that is necessary in order radically to change your life. And what I mean by radically, I suppose, is two things. It changes you at the very heart. That's what radical actually means. It gets to the very heart of the matter, changes you. But that reveals itself in a radically changed life in the sense that you completely turn around. Your life, which was solely spent on yourself or on the world, on the things of, basically of Satan, which you didn't even realize was the case, is now directed towards God, towards his glory, towards his honor. Now, before, well, I should say before, you, you were rebels against God. I mean, the Lord is in control. He is the one who commands us to do what is right, but you weren't willing to submit to that. But now you are. Now you willingly bend the knee to submit to all his holy will, to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your king. And Paul tells you that because this is the case, because of this new life that is in you, because you have in fact died to sin, now you are to see yourselves. And I think this is a very helpful way to look at it. You are to see yourselves as those who have been raised from the dead, now only to serve the Lord alone. In other words, when you died, you died entirely to the old man. And the Lord raised you again up to life to serve him and to serve him alone. Now this evening, let's consider that if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have been raised to spirit, from spiritual death to spiritual life, now to live for God's glory alone. What we want to look at are basically two things. First, what it means to live to God. What does this life mean? You know, what is it that, that Paul's actually telling us is the case here? And then secondly, to spend a little bit of time applying this to see what it will look like or what it should look like in your lives. Now, first of all, what does it mean to live for God? I think most basically it means that you will do what he wants you to do. That's what the new principle desires. God desires holiness. God really desires perfect love. Love towards him. And respect, of course, which love gives. And love towards our neighbor. That's what the law of God is really directed toward. And that's what the whole revealed will of God is directed toward is love. Well, since the Lord has put a principle of love in your heart, which loves those very things, then that shouldn't be difficult, of course, to do. The life of God in you, first of all, means that you will do what God wants you to do because really that's what you want to do. So you will do what he wants you to do rather than what you want to do if what you want to do happens to be something that is contrary to his will. Whenever your will comes in conflict with God's will, you yield to his will. You do what he wants. So if you are to live for God, you must choose what you know he says in his word is honoring to him. I think it's interesting that um, Jonathan Edwards wrote in his very first resolution, and he wrote these resolutions when he was a very young man. By the way, he wasn't converted at birth. He didn't believe he came into the world as, as a Christian already believing. He wasn't even converted when he was a very... Uh, young man or a youth, I should say, but actually I think it was more towards his late teens. And then he began to realize what, what it was that the Christian life was all about. He began writing his resolutions, as I've said, at a very early age because he wanted to get the most out of his life for the glory of God. And this was his first resolution. Now, think about this for a minute. We're going to, I'm just going to read it and then have a couple things to say about it. He says this, resolve, or this is what I'm resolving to do that I will do whatever I think to be most to the glory of God and my own good profit in pleasure in the whole of my duration 
without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so many myriads of ages hence, resolve to do whatever I think to be my duty, and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general, resolve so to do whatever difficulties I meet with, how many soever, and how great soever. Now I want you to understand that Edwards is not saying in this resolution that I'm going to do what I think is most glorifying to God, but I'm also going to do what is good for me and for my profit and my pleasure. He doesn't see those two things as being contrary. But basically what he means is when I, when I uh, do what I believe is glorifying to God, those things I know at the same time will work together for my good, for my profit, and for my pleasure. I'm going to do that my entire life. I'm going to do my duty. And by the way, when he says, I, I will do my duty and that which is good for, the, uh, for mankind to their advantage, again, it's not two different things, but the same thing. And he's going to do it no matter how difficult it may be and no matter what he has to face. So choosing God's will. He did not believe that choosing God's will is something that would ultimately hurt you or rob you of anything, but in the end would end in your blessing. There's a reason why the Lord wants you to choose his way, why he wants you to be alive to him, why it is that he has transformed your life and given you a love for these particular things, because these are the things that are best not only for you, for your profit and for your pleasure and to your advantage, but also for the advantage of mankind in general, which means it's good for everyone that you do these things. They always end in blessing. Now, as again, as I've said, you will not only do what God wants you to do, but you will do them for the right reasons. You will do them because you want to do them. That's what it means to be alive to God. And you'll do them not only because you are thankful, again, for what the Lord has done for you, and you will not only do them because you love God and you know these things are pleasing to Him. You know these things will glorify Him, although you will do those things for that reason. But you will do them because being alive to God, this is what you actually want to do. You will prefer His way of doing things to your way of doing things if they should, in fact, uh, be contrary to one another or in some way contradictory. You will not simply obey him because he's forcing you to do it. Because of what he threatens if you don't do it. There are some people who serve God purely out of fear. But it should not be that way for you if you have the life of God in you. You will not serve God purely because of what others think of you or don't think of you with regard to how you do it. You won't be doing it for other people to put on a show and you won't be doing it simply because of what you might think of yourself if you, you know, don't do what God calls you to do. I mean, sometimes we have to keep up, as it were, a certain level of good works to convince ourselves that we're Christians. But that's not the reason why we do these things or why we will do them if we have the life of God in us. We will do them because we really do want to do them. We'll reflect that same attitude it was in the psalmist who wrote Psalm 119 when he says, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Not because I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell if I don't do it. Lord, please help me to meditate on your word. But because I love it and I want to go that direction. You will do it because you are a new creature who delights in doing everything that is good and right. So to live for God, first of all, means that you will do His will, and you will do it because that's what you want to do. But it means, third, that you will do it no matter what it might cost you personally, even when it's difficult. It reminds me again of Pilgrim's Progress, chapter 12, the hill of difficulty. You will still take that mountain. You will still go over that mountain, even though it means difficulty. Again, Jonathan Edwards wrote in his... Uh, well, in a later resolution, this one's number 57. Resolved, when I fear misfortunes and adversity, to examine whether I have done my duty and resolve to do it and let the event be just as providence orders it. 
I will, as far as I can, be concerned about nothing but my duty and my sin. And I realize that needs a little bit of interpretation. Uh, what he means by this, when he says, when I fear misfortunes and adversity, he, he, what he means is that if I do God's will, and I look ahead and I see what's at the end of that path, you know, I know if I talk to this person, this person's going to be angry at me. In this case, Edwards knew when he uh, was in his pulpit in Northampton, if he came out uh, uh, pointedly against his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, who was the previous pastor of that church, and goes against what he taught regarding the Lord's Supper and converting ordinances, he knew, humanly speaking, that it was going to end in his dismissal. He knew that the people would not accept what he had to say, and yet he knew, because this was God's word, that it was his duty to proclaim it. So he says, in this situation and in all situations, I'm not going to just look at what I fear might happen, but I'm going to do what is my duty, and I'm going to avoid sinning in this situation, and I'm going to let God work out everything else. He says, I'm, I'm going to examine whether I've done my duty and resolve to do it and let the event be just as providence orders it. In other words, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I can guess what's going to happen. I can see the handwriting on the wall. But God ultimately is in control of things. I'm going to do what's right, and then God will do what is pleasing in his sight. So when you are faced with a choice, you will choose what God wants you to do, even if it looks like your choice is going to put you in a very difficult situation. It is far better to choose what is right and to suffer for it than to choose what is wrong in order to avoid suffering. In the end, it will work out for your blessing. And again, as, as I'm saying these things, I'm thinking about Pilgrim's Progress chapter 12. Again, the Lord seems to be ordering this as something he wants to bring to our attention. But think about that as you read chapter 12. What happens to those who go off the path to avoid the difficulty versus the one who actually takes the hill, who is pilgrim or Christian? Now, fourthly, it means that you will do what God wants you to do at all times. Not just on Sunday. Not just when others are watching you. But you will do it even in secret when nobody else but God can see you. Because your life will be aimed at his pleasure, not at the pleasure of others. You know, you're, you're living to honor him, and he sees you at all times. And so you know that what you do in secret is still going to be something which is just as open to God as if you're doing it in front of a crowd. And you will still live that kind of life because you still want to honor him even when others are not around. So you will do it at all times. And you will do it for the rest of your life. Not just when you're young, and then when you get older, think, well, I've put in my time. I'm not going to do anything more. And not just when you're old. I'm going to put off Christianity until I'm a little bit older, and then when I, you know, I've had my fun and done all the things I think I want to do with my life, then I'll begin to get serious. You will serve God from the time that he makes you alive spiritually to the time when you finally die and enter into heaven. Okay, this is what it means to live for God. You do his will because you want to do his will. Even if it means adversity, you do it all the time, and you do it from the time that you're alive, from the time he makes you alive, to the time when your physical life in this world is over, to the rest of your days. Now, secondly, let's consider a little bit about what this might look like in your life. I think you can see from what we've already seen. But when you move from spiritual death to spiritual life, it should make a remarkable difference in the way that you live. It should create a radical change. I mean, you were dead, and now you're alive. The old way of living should be broken, and you should begin to live a new kind of life, as we've already seen. Now, again, I have to mention this because it is so prevalent in the churches today. In so many churches, if not most churches today, Conversion simply means I now attend church on Sundays, at least sometimes when it doesn't get in the way of my schedule, my usual schedule. Uh, I attend Bible studies, again, occasionally when it's convenient. If the church has a prayer meeting, perhaps I'll go sometimes, but again, less frequently than the other meetings. 
If I happen to be young, I'll go to the youth meetings because they're fun. But that's usually about it in the case of many. Nothing else seems to change in their lives, the way they live day-to-day -day life, the things they do, the way they do things, uh, even their personal devotion or their devotional habits or personal piety. A lot of those things just don't change. They just go on living the way they were living before. They just go on living and doing what they want to do, but they put their time in on Sunday and perhaps on other occasions, maybe for works of super irrigation, you know, that is above and beyond the call of duty, just to make sure that I've satisfied what God desires. Well, you know, this is so common that many churches have actually developed a theology to explain how it is that people can come forward and pray the prayer and then live a life that really hasn't changed at all. And I think you know that, that um, they call it the gospel of grace. They try to get rid of all the works, all the law, all the obedience, all the changed life. They say that's just works. The gospel is of pure grace. It's all the work of God. It has nothing to do with us. And so if you add works at all, you destroy the gospel. This is the true gospel of grace, they say. Well, we call it easy believism. And we call it the destruction of the gospel. Because the whole point of the gospel is to turn us around from being rebels to being obedient servants. If there is no change in our lives, then we're not saved. Paul tells us the change is going to be far more radical than no change at all. It was certainly the case in his own life, wasn't it? Because before he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, when his heart was uh, basically dead in sin, he was entirely indisposed toward the Lord. All he wanted to do was destroy the church. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest as many Christians as he might find there, to drag them off to prison, to put them on trial to try to force them to blaspheme God, and if they wouldn't turn, to put them to death. But when he was converted on that road, that old man died, and he became a new creature. His life was entirely turned around, and he began immediately to preach the gospel. He did everything in his power from that point on to give glory to God. Now, being raised to spiritual life must create a change that everyone can see. You know, those who saw Paul realized that there was a change that took place in his life. They didn't know what to make of him. The one who was well, trying to destroy the church was now preaching the very faith that he was trying to eradicate. Uh, he even did so no matter what persecution and suffering that he had to endure, and the change was not a temporary change, but it was a permanent change. He kept on pursuing these things to the very end of his life because he loved the Lord more than his life. Now, the change in your life may not be as powerful, it may not be as obvious as it was in the life of, of the Apostle Paul, it might be much more subtle, but it has to be as radical because the principles within your heart have changed. Uh, you no longer have that predominant hatred of God that you had once before, but now love becomes predominant if you are alive to God. Now, when you are dead to sin and alive to God, as I mentioned before, you no longer ask the question, what do I want to do? But you ask the question, what does God want me to do? You don't look in the Bible to see if you can justify what it is that, that you might like to do. But you look in the Bible to find out what it is that God wants you to do. What direction does he want me to take? You no longer live for yourself, but you live for God. Basically saying, you take the helm of my life. You steer me the direction you want to go by your word and by your spirit. You begin to understand why it is that you even exist. I mean, why you're even here in the world. And it's not to have as much fun as you possibly can have before you die or to have all the experiences that you would like to have in life or to make your mark on the world so that people will remember you when you're gone. But you see that your purpose is really to bring as much glory and pleasure to God as you possibly can. 
to leave a mark on this world for him. Again, look at some of the great examples of that in the Apostle Paul once he was converted, or George Whitfield again once he was converted, or Jonathan Edwards. You don't see people seeking their own pleasure, at least in the things of the world. They seek their pleasure in the things of the Lord and pursue those things. And the mark that they left on the world was the mark of the gospel. It wasn't the mark of their personality, their gifts, and various things that they did to display their talents. But Jesus Christ was the one who became prominent in their lives. That which the true believer will do, and that which he will seek after, is to bring pleasure and glory to God to love him, to serve him, and to bring as much glory as they possibly can to his name in whatever circumstances they're in and whatever opportunities the Lord happens to give you, whatever the cost may be to you personally. It is to give your life to God in the same way that Jesus gave his life to God. As Paul wrote in our meditation this morning, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. By which he means not only that I walk through life uh, believing in, in trusting in Jesus Christ to save me from my sins, but I also walk through life obeying him. Faith is, is not simply a belief but faith is active obedience to the whole will of God. That's what it means to believe in him, to trust in him. And that's what it means to be alive in him. So the question that you should be asking yourself when it comes to life in general is not what do I want to do with my life, but what does God want me to do with it? What did he make me for? It shouldn't be, what do I want to do today, but what does God want me to do today? You are not to live for yourself, but you are to live for God. Paul writes in Romans 14, verses 7 through 8, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. I think you can see the principle comes out quite plainly here. And this is what we're going to be exploring over the next several Lord's Day evenings. If we are true believers, if we are to attain to the resurrection of the dead, if the kingdom of heaven is to move forward, then we have to die to ourselves and we need to live to God. Now again, we're going to unpack that. We're going to see what it means and what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean, again, that you have to stop being a mother or father. It doesn't mean you have to quit your job or, or those types of things, again, unless the things you're doing happen to be sinful. But what it does mean is that you will do those things no longer for recognition for yourself, no longer to honor yourself, but rather you will do these things for God's glory and you will do them in a way that brings glory to him. So in closing this topic today, ask yourself these questions. Have I died with Christ to sin? Or am I still living in sin? Have I been raised with him to newness of life? Do I now live for God? Does my life actually show that I have died to sin and I am alive to God? If, if um, the people around me, if I were to ask them, Am I showing the life of Christ? Am I living the way Jesus Christ would live? Would they tell me yes or no? Now, if the answer to these things are yes, you need to remember that this doesn't mean that you're no longer going to struggle with sin or with obedience because the struggle is going to be lifelong. You are going to struggle. What it means is that you, again, have been freed from sin, but to, as it were, acquire more of that victory. You need to nurture that desire that God has put within your heart, that love. You can nurture it. You can strengthen it through the means of grace that God has given to you. And you need, you need to use those means of prayer and of the word, of worship and of fellowship. 
and at the same time seek to put off or to kill the desires of the old you that was crucified. I mean, that old man doesn't die easily, we know. It, it lives on throughout our lives, and it's going to constantly be asserting itself into our lives. We need to kill it. John Owen's illustration of the, of the wild beast that's, in the, that's locked into the room with you is a good one. If you don't take your dagger and, and keep stabbing that thing constantly to try to you know, weaken it, to, as he put it, let out its blood so it's no longer a threat to you, that thing will grow stronger and it will attack you and it will kill you. That's the old man in the room with you. He's still in your heart. He still wants to assert himself. He still wants what he wants. He still wants the world. He still wants sin. He still hates God. And he's going to assert those things unless you use the means of grace to grow stronger and you kill those sins. You need to be doing that constantly. So if the answer is yes, there's still going to be a struggle. You still need to fight. There's still work to be done. You still need to use the means of grace. But if the answer is no, if there is no change, if you haven't died to sin, if you're not alive to God, if your life is not demonstrating this new life, then what you need to do is come to Jesus and trust in Jesus. Be crucified with Jesus and be raised again with him by faith. You need to become a new creature in Christ by trusting in him, remembering that if the old you doesn't die, there will be no new you to live with him forever in heaven. The old man has to go out, as I mentioned before, or he is going to kill you. You've got to put the old man to death, and trusting in Jesus is the only way that you can possibly do that. So if you are not a new creature in Christ, if you've not died with him, if you've not been raised again to life, if your life has not been transformed, then you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for his life. He's the only one who can save you. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask again for the Lord and his grace and mercy to show us our condition and then to seek him for the remedy, either more of his grace to continue the battle or his grace to make us alive that we may begin the battle. Let's pray.